Thank you, Rick. I'd invite all of us to turn into our copy of the Word of God, the Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 30. Pastor and Christy are away today attending Bailey's graduation. Uh, she's graduating from college today, uh, did it in three years, and Pastor and Christy are very proud of her. And since she's graduating, even though it's on a Sunday, he thought he probably should be there. <laughs> So we're so thankful uh, for them and her accomplishments and glad that they can all be together there at her graduation today. This morning, we're going to look at the only miracle in the New Testament that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, the only one, with the exception of the miracle of the resurrection. You might have heard of that miracle. Each gospel covers this miracle in a very unique perspective, through different lenses and different ways. And today we're going to look at the miracle according to the way that Mark wrote it down, the way that he observed it, the way that he remembered it, and the way that it was recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The focus of our discussion this morning is not going to be so much on the miracle itself, but the examples of generosity that all led up to the miracle taking place. The story of Jesus miraculously feeding 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish is a powerful illustration of the way in which generosity and divine intervention, when they intersect, can allow great things to happen. It's more than just a miracle we're going to talk about. For us today, it's going to be a teaching moment that hopefully we'll be able to glean some things from and plug them into our life to allow our life to closely be aligned, even more so, with where Christ wants us. Now, we're jumping right into Mark chapter 6. Five chapters have already happened, and we're going to start right at verse 30, so 29 other verses have already happened, so let's get the context of where we're jumping in at. When we glance at the verses above and the chapters before, in in all the gospel accounts, we learn something tragic happened. We see the taking of the life of John the Baptist at the hand of Herod. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. So we're talking the death of a family member here. Even more so, John the Baptist was the forerunner who announced the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. So he was also a very close partner in ministry with Jesus. When the disciples heard about the death of John the Baptist, they went and they claimed his body and provided a burial. And this event, no doubt, deeply impacted Jesus. And we're going to work our way verse by verse through today's passage. So as we jump into verse 30, understand the weight that is on Jesus Christ and also the weight that is on the disciples. Verse 30. And the apostles gathered, gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, that's Jesus talking to the disciples, saying, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure, so much as to eat. There was so much going on, they just didn't have leisure, meaning rest, but they didn't have time to have a proper meal, time to eat. Have you ever had a day so busy or so packed or life gets so crazy that mealtime passes by and you realize, oh, we didn't eat. I forgot to eat. I was so wrapped up in what I was doing or I was so upset about what was happening. I didn't have an appetite and I didn't eat. And then your body begins to get faint. It begins to get weak. That's where the disciples are. Mark and his account is telling us they've been running ragged. There's heavy burden upon them. They have not had rest. They have not had time to eat. And Jesus says, we need to get out of here. And Jesus, seeing his disciples needing that rest, decided to cross over the Sea of Galilee to find some solitude as they rest and as they mourn the loss of John the Baptist. 
It's important for us to note here that Jesus is seeking solitude here. He's not seeking isolation. And we have to understand the difference between the two. Isolation is being cut off. It is being separated. It is disconnecting from everyone else. Solitude is deliberate retreat. And in that retreat, there is growth and there is strength and there is time spent with God to speak to us and restore our soul. And Jesus looks at his disciples and direct quote says, Come ye yourselves apart. He is saying, let's come apart before we all come apart. They had no time to even eat. Look at verse 32. What did they do? And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Anyone here today looking for an excuse or a sign to take a cruise this summer? Here it is. Jesus just got on a boat. But as they got on that boat, and as they crossed over that sea, they weren't wearing camo, so they got spotted. Somebody saw them. And word spread, and word got out. Look at verse 33. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. Without the use of social media, the news of Jesus spotted went viral. Out they came from the cities, and they followed Jesus. Other accounts of Scripture that record this story, very early on, earlier than Mark, already tell us 5,000 men followed Jesus. Now, the accounts only count the men, and they're very careful to tell us 5,000 men, not people. So if there were wives with them, if there were children with them, that number grows exponentially. Even if it was only a wife and one child, we're still looking at a crowd of 15,000 people. And here's Jesus with his disciples, feeling the weight that he is feeling. What does he do when he looks over his shoulder and sees the throng of people knowing they're coming for him? There wasn't a hallway for him to duck down or a room to retreat to. So what does he do? Verse, six, verse 33 tells us. I'm sorry, 34. And Jesus, when he came out, noticed the three things he did. Number one, he saw much people. And was, number two, moved with compassion toward them. Why? Because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he, number three, began to teach them many things. Here we see a generosity of compassion come out of Jesus. Why was it so generous? Because he was tired himself. The fleshly side of him, the part of him that was man, was aching and it was hurting for his recent loss. He was tired from the ministry, but yet he had compassion when he looked out on this group. And to extend any bandwidth at this moment must have seemed to the disciples like an unreasonable time to show any gener generosity whatsoever. But we know that Jesus saw with his eyes. He was then moved in his heart with compassion. And then he acted on it. Notice the progression there. He saw, he was moved, and then he acted. He acted because he looked at them and he saw like they were sheep just without a shepherd. We don't have to be a shepherd and we don't have to be an expert on sheep to understand that without a shepherd, sheep will scatter and they'll be lost. And when sheep are lost, they will likely die from injury, from starvation or from attack. However, on the other hand, a good shepherd will keep the flock together and it will thrive and they'll be guided to safe pastures and they will be protected from predators. And he looks at this group coming and he says, they are like sheep. They are, they are leaderless. His compassion grows. It was great. And out of that compassion gave him energy. It gave him strength to help them. Notice the end of verse 34. I kind of just went right over it when I was reading it. But what did Jesus do? He began to teach them many things. 
So when he turned around and he addressed them, he didn't tell them, look, I'm going to give you just a little devotion today and then I'm going to let you go. He didn't say, let's unpack one of these verses out of the Old Testament because I know you don't have long, meaning he didn't want to stay long. He didn't do that. It wasn't a Sunday school hour or a connection group time. He taught them many things. He was not hurried. He was deliberate to teach truth. Where did he muster the strength and the energy to do that? From his compassion for them, he found it. And he taught them many things. What were the many things that he taught? Well, for to look at past times where we have more details of what he taught. He no doubt taught about things like repentance and faith and called them to turn away from their sin and to accept him as Savior and trust in God's mercy and grace. He no doubt taught about the accessibility that they have, that the kingdom is available to all regardless of the social status that you have, your ethnicity, your religious background. He welcomed sinners. He welcomed outcasts. He welcomed the marginalized, all of them. He demonstrated God's love and his acceptance was for everyone. He no doubt taught about transformation and that those who enter the kingdom would experience real and radical change in their life. And this change would then be character, characterized by love and humility and the ability and the want to serve those that are around you. Notice his generosity of compassion that he had for them led him and was the platform for him to be able to go ahead and tell the good news of the gospel. Everything Jesus did, every story he told, every time he taught, it was the, the driver was to get to the gospel, to get to the kingdom and why they were there. He saw people and he saw souls that needed him. So everywhere he went, he spoke of his father and the mission, his mission here on earth. I love telling the story of how salvation came to my family through my dad's side. We have to go all the way back to my great uncle Pizzo, born and raised in Italy. When he was a little older, they moved over to the States in New York. Like most Italians, they were devout Catholics, never missed a service, did everything the church asked them to do. And then one day, my great uncle was reading his Bible, and he came across a word that he did not understand, and the word was saved. Thou shalt be saved. He had not heard that word in mass before. He didn't know what it meant. So he went to the one person who perhaps could tell him what the word saved meant, and that was his priest. He went down to the Catholic church and asked to speak to the priest, sat down with him. He said, I'm reading my Bible and help me understand what does the word saved mean? Now this goes way back decades to New York, hardened Italian community. And the priest looked at him and said, you don't need to worry about that. You just follow the teachings of the church and you will be okay. My great uncle left there very dissatisfied with the answer that he was given because it did not answer his question at all. So he did the only thing that he knew to do, and that was to go down the street and start asking people what it meant to be saved. So he'd go up to one person, he asked them, do you know what it means to be saved? Eventually, the Lord led him to a Christian. Imagine walking down the street and someone coming up to you asking you, do you know what it means to be saved? It's kind of like soul winning in reverse, where they come find the Christians. My uncle got saved right there on the sidewalk that day. Immediately, he became burdened for his priest because he did not understand what the word saved meant. So he went back to the church to tell the pastor the biblical meaning of the word saved. That meeting did not go well at all. The priest had two men of the church take my uncle by each side, brought him to the front, and threw him down the front steps of the church. My uncle stood up, brushed himself off, and in a broken Italian-English accent, looked up at the priest in the way that he would say, he said, just for that, I'm going to tell everyone about Jesus Christ. And he did. You weren't in his presence for more than five minutes, I am told. 
without him asking you about your faith. And if you knew his Savior, out of Christ's compassion for that people, he wanted them to hear more about the kingdom and how it was accessible to all and it could transfer or transform your life. The Bible tells us Jesus spoke about many things, and time slipped away. Look at verse 35. I wonder if anyone noticed how long he went. Let's look at verse 35. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples, yep, they noticed, came unto him and said, this is a desert place, and now the time is far past. So pretty much in modern English, the disciples were saying, hey, Jesus, uh, you went a little long. You're long-winded today. We need to let them go. Truth is, they're the ones that wanted to go. Verse 36. Send them away, the disciples said, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Disciples tell Jesus they're faint. They've been here for a long time. Let's let them go. And they could find, they could go to all the different villages that are around here and get something to eat. It's dinner time. They need to go. And Jesus looks at them and does not say, great idea, guys. Let's break, and then we'll all come right back here. Jesus doesn't say that. You know what Jesus says? I got an idea. Let's feed them. Okay, imagine 15 people showing up at your house at about 1 o'clock today wanting to be fed. Ladies, any pressure there? Imagine 50, 50 showing up. Imagine 15,000 people showing up, and you have to feed them. Jesus says, let's go ahead and feed them. Verse 37, and he answered unto them, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Immediately the questions start firing away. Some commentators believe the amount, 200 penny worth, comes up because that's what they had in the disciple money bag. That's the money that they had, and they knew the approximate amount. So they're asking, should we go ahead and take our 200 penny worth, our whole money bag, and buy bread for them? Philip, and John's account, speaks up and says, I don't think 200 penny worth would even be enough to feed this many people. What do you think Jesus then said? That's a wrap then. Okay, forget it. Nope. He goes on. Verse 38. And he said unto them, how many loaves have ye? Okay, let's stop the question, stop the verse right there. Sometimes we read a verse as if the whole thing happened right in one second, in the amount of time we just read the verse. So just imagine Jesus looks at his disciples, how much bread do we have, guys? And just lets that just hang in the air for a moment. Disciples looking around, say, ah. We don't have any. Do you have any? I don't have any. I would have eaten it if I did. Or Peter probably said, I don't know. I already ate mine. I don't have any either. Okay, Jesus goes on in the verse and says, well, go and see. Let's find out. And when they knew, they say, five and two fishes. Once again, a lot of time passes from the first word of this verse to the last word of this verse. He says, go ahead and find out. They go ahead and find out. And we know by other accounts, a little boy was found who had five loaves and two fishes. And he is brought forward. Jesus wanted the the disciples to recognize how much they currently have available. They said none. He said, go find some. They come back and inventory is taken. Everyone counts the loaves. There are five. It didn't take long to count the fish. There's only two. And here we see a generosity of resources. It might have seemed like a very unreasonable thing for a boy to give up his whole lunch. We knew exactly what was there. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't asking for much. That day, all he needed were the five and the two. While he may not be asking much, he is asking them to bring what they do have. It wasn't that the boy only was willing to give up five and two. Because he actually had ten and four and he just kept half. What he gave was everything that he had. He was very generous with his resources, even though it wasn't much. It is Jesus that blesses, and he multiplies what we bring. When we ourselves surrender what we have to him and simply offer it to Jesus, he takes it. 
What we have, it doesn't matter how much it is, but what we're willing to give to him, he takes that and he blesses it and makes it abundantly, exceedingly more than we could ever imagine. Because generosity is not about how much you have in your pocket, how much you have in your 401k or your bank account. That's nothing to do with it. It's about what's in your heart. The potential to be generous is available to everyone in this room. Potential. You know what the word potential means? We sometimes hear it as a very positive word. It's almost a negative word. Potential sounds like, oh, he can do it. But it also means you haven't done it yet. We all have potential within us to be used in even greater ways. I find it interesting here, too, that in the overall count, we know there are 5,000 men, the women and the children were not counted at all. But isn't it amazing that the person that God ends up using wasn't even counted? It is the one that wasn't even included in the count that came forward. And I think there's a lesson for us in that. God uses people who others don't count. Because God sees something and someone that he can use. To be generous people, we have to get over the idea that we, that everything we have is ours and that we are the owner. Proper perspective is understanding everything we have is on loan from God. We don't own it. We know we can't take it with us. God says, this is what I am granting you for now, and it is on loan. He wants to see what we're going to do with it. I think the world is yearning to see some generosity from Christians. And it's Christians that need to lead the way. We need to be the examples of generosity. We need to be the example and have a reputation of people who love others, who care about the needs of others. We just don't stand around about it. We just don't get in our small groups and talk about it, but we get involved. We find ways to make a difference. Jesus takes those five loaves and his two fish. Meanwhile, 15,000 people are out there in front of him. And notice what he does with those once they are in his hands. Verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed. Jesus takes this food, he lifts it up, and he thanks God for it. First thing he does is blesses the food. Was it enough? Didn't seem like it. But nonetheless, Jesus was generate, or generous in demonstrating his thankfulness. It wasn't enough. If I was a disciple that day, and I've seen Jesus perform miracles in the past, and this time he's taking up this little boy's lunch and holding it up, and he starts praying, you know what I'm doing during prayer? I'm peeking. When is it going to happen? Are we going to open our eyes and all of a sudden there's a huge buffet going down the middle of the field? When is it going to happen? Jesus lifts up the food. It surely seemed unreasonable to be thankful for so little. Why, Jesus, are you saying thanks for something that is so small? But until we could be thankful for something that's not enough, then what we have will never be multiplied to more than enough. We have to be thankful for what God currently has given us. But if we say, Lord, this job, it isn't what I wanted. This house is not the dream house that I always wanted. This life did not turn out as I had expected. But nonetheless, I still lift it up to you and I thank you for it. Until we are generous for what we have, we'll never see God multiply in a great way on our behalf. Gratitude should not be dependent on magnitude. Great blessings can come out of small packages. Jesus ends his prayer. Everyone opens their eyes, and there's still only five loaves and two fish. Jesus then begins to break the bread, and he's passing it to each of the disciples. We know the beginning inventory started with five and two. But then we begin to lose count after he breaks it. The breaking of all of the food was necessary for the blessing to be carried out. I think we could apply that in our life, the life that refuses to be broken 
is a life that refuses to be blessed. It's the breaking of life that we see great blessings. Some of the most blessed people I know went through something that broke them. And they saw God work in amazing ways. And the disciples, the more that they broke the food, the more it multiplied. In verse 42, we then fast forward till the meal is all over. In verse 42, it simply says, And they did all eat and were all filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. So we know that as they broke that bread and as they broke up the fish and passed it out, everyone that was there, potentially 15,000 people, not only had something to eat, but had enough to eat where they were full. And if they wanted more to eat, there were leftovers for them. Did you ever wonder what Jesus would have done if the boy never came forward with five loaves and two fishes? What if he only had one fish and one loaf of bread? It would not have made a difference. God could have fed them with just a crumb and a fin if he had to. The amount we give matters far less than the spirit in which we give. Most of us think that generosity is something that God wants from us. God wants that from us. But the truth is, the heart of God wants generosity for us. Because He knows that out of our generosity will come back so much more for us, will come out of it much blessings in our behalf. So it's not something that He's grabbing for. It's more of a hand that's open that He's saying, I want more for you. Here's my concluding thought. The foundation of the generous life is a generous God. Has God been generous to you? Has God been generous to you in his love? He has here. He invites all of us to live a life of generosity. The truth is, an unbelieving world, they might look on and they might say, your generosity is absolutely unreasonable. And from a worldly perspective outside of the Bible, they are 100% right. It does seem absolutely unreasonable to live such a generous life. But Paul, in Romans chapter 12, in the very first verse, addresses that. Look what he says. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Anything that we do for the Lord, any of our generosity is absolutely reasonable because of what he has done for us. So I think it's fair to say that if we are followers of God, we should seek to be generous. Generous in our compassion. Regardless of how worn down we are or what we're currently going through. But like Jesus, if we see and it moves our heart, it will cause us to act. We need to be generous in our resources. We need to be generous in our thankfulness. And the motivation for generosity is love. God loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What was God's motivation to give his son to the world? It was love for us. God has been so generous to us. Who are we to hang on so tight to what he has loaned us? But we can make a big impact on many and see God multiply what we see as so little if we're just generous with what he currently put into our hands. Let's pray, shall we?